Creativity is the soul of an artist and it is the fundamental step in the process of making of music making. We all know that it can sometimes be very difficult to, to be creative and get some inspiration, uh, make a killer tune. One very important item in the international indie music uh, season's agenda is to discover the secrets behind music creation and help more indie musicians unlock their hidden talents and support their development. Uh, our discussion here today will aim at providing all other musicians, that's all, that's a lot of, a lot of uh, expectation, all other musicians, um, all other music, musicians, some tips and suggestions for their uh, compositional process and of course an opportunity to learn how as an artist you can get inspired, create uh, and create more wonderful music. Um, we'll go around and just do a little quick introduction uh, of who we are and where we're currently um, Zooming from. So my name is uh, Glennie G and I'm the export music producer for Sounds Australia. My job pre-BC was to fly all around the world uh, to showcase conferences presenting Australian music to the rest of the world. That's me. Um, I'm in my screen, I'm going to go around this way. So Josh, do you want to just give a little bit of a rundown of who you are, where you are? Yeah, sure. Well, my name is Josh Kambi, and we are in my studio in LA right now that I probably should not leave for the next four months, the way this is going. Um, and I'm a uh, artist, uh, producer, and songwriter, and I have my artist project that I do, uh, done some features with some DJs, and now I'm working with Avex, who's my amazing partner, uh, and Quattro in Scandinavia. And I also write and produce for a lot of other artists and TV shows. Great. M M M M X M Q. That wasn't even the hard one. Yeah. Hello, I'm M X M Tune. I'm also Maya. If M X M Tune is just a little too difficult to say, it's my adult braces. My silly adult braces. I can't get around words anymore. I don't blame you. It's okay. I'm a singer songwriter, a musician. I write a lot of acoustic music, and I've been working on more produced projects lately. But right now, I am zooming from my family's house. I am in my home studio here in Oakland, California, which is really close nearby to San Francisco, if you don't know what city that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Cha Cha? Oh, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Cha Cha Yahaya Han. So everybody calls me Cha Cha. I think it's easier. But I released it under my family name, uh, Yahaya Han. Now I'm in Shanghai, China. Uh, I just moved to a new place. This is where I am now. I'm a uh, independent musician, uh, mainly vocalist, but I also uh, produce uh, for myself and also a documentary and uh, independent movies. So yes, this is who I am. Great. Um, so before, I mean, this is obviously where we're doing this via Zoom because of the weird existence that we're all living in right now. Um, but I just want to go back a little bit and just kind of, and, and this is an open discussion, so please feel free to just answer wherever. But um, I just want to kind of get an idea of where you guys started and how you got to be where you are now. What was the, um, how did you first get into music or get inspired to create music? Um, MXM tune, I might start with you. Yeah. Um, so I was actually forced to play music when I was really little instead of actually choosing to do it. My mom signed me up for violin and cello lessons from a very young age, and that was my introduction to music. Um, I actually hated learning and practicing at that point because it was something that was forced upon me. Eventually, I found singing in ukulele, which is my music, my instrument of choice for a lot of my songwriting um, when I was around 12 years old and that kind of redefined what music meant to me because I think at that point I had trained only classically and there's a lot of limitations with classical music in the way that there isn't with something like indie music or just folk songwriting and everything like that and I ended up really enjoying playing the ukulele and singing and because it was something that I came across on my own kind of timeline and not something like the cello where I was being forced to practice for an hour every single day seven days a week I really enjoyed doing it and it was something that I found out I could do for a living later on. Um, but it was not something I really believed I could be a musician for uh, until last year even. Musician, being a musician was not something I ever dared to dream about. I was gonna go to school for architecture. Uh, 
that didn't turn out obviously the way I thought it would because now I'm a musician for a living. Uh, but yeah, I, I think a series of really wonderfully lucky moments led me to where I am now with music and I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. Well, well okay, let's go, well, let's go through some lucky moments. <laughs> okay. what, is, what, what, do people, what do people need to look out for? Well, okay, so I think one of the things that was lucky for me, I got a lot of traction on YouTube, so I found a couple videos that were kind of catching fire on that platform, and um, I also got mentioned in a couple editorial places around like bedroom pop music and the indie kind of space that was being created at that point in time in like 2017, I want to say. Uh, so I think... I guess tastemakers is how I would put it. Indie tastemakers kind of came across my music and wrote about it. And I was just a kid in high school. And so I was really freaking out over everything that was happening. Um, but yeah, I, I think it was just like, everything kind of fell into place at the right moment of time. And I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around how it all happened because I can barely process the fact that I get to do this for my job. <laughs> yeah. well, what, what made you, what made you even want to put something up on YouTube? Like, what was that? What, what was I, that inspiration? Yeah, I actually approached the internet as a place because I thought nobody would listen to me. At that point, I was making music because it was kind of my format of a diary entry and putting it online felt like shouting into the void and nobody was going to shout back to me. I got really lucky though, and people did listen and shout back at me from the void of the internet. And, um, but yeah, it was really my place to just be expressive of my own creativity and my story. And it felt like there were no rules and that made it a lot easier to kind of approach even making something in the first place. So yeah, that's why I went for it in the first place. Mm -hmm. What about you, Cha Cha? Is that, is, is in any of that ringing true for your experience of getting into music? Uh, no, actually, I think, uh, uh, I get in, in touch with internet very late actually. Uh, I was, Born and grow in a mountain area with minority area, so there's no much source about I can really get information from the world outside. So I actually got very the first uh, inspiration from my mom. She's a huge Bollywood movie fan, so that was quite interesting for me to getting know the music. I pass on the local minority music. Then the sound from outside the world is actually very beginning with Bollywood, like Indian music. Then uh, after that, I, I, I start to go to another town, bigger town for uh, study. Then I, I start to meet a bunch of people who has a tiny small shop doing recycling CDs and cassettes. Um, so actually that is the, the huge help for me to open a new world because uh, during that time, it's like 80s or 90s, like apart from TV or radio, I can't really get any music information, but we don't really have that kind of channel to really introduce music or modern music or music video. So basically for us, uh, apart from the mainstream uh, media source, there's no way for us to get something else. But I think I was just like so lucky to meet a bunch of very cool kids during that time. And we started digging into the huge boxes of recycling cassettes and CDs. Uh, then I started getting to know so much different, different kind of music that just, uh, I think that's a proper musical education for me. And we, we, we listen to music, uh, we, don't, we don't know the name, we can't read English, we don't know the lyrics, or the cassettes and, and CDs we pick by the cover. If the cover looks cool, we give it a try. Um, but I think, yeah, then from then we start to exchange with all the, the CD and cassettes that we fixed. Uh, then to, to meeting friends, to make friends, then I start to uh, build up my first uh, a band. Um, then from can, you then, remember, can you remember the first time you performed? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it's not like, it's such a small city, small town, no much uh, people really know what we're doing, we're all kind of like uh, bad kids. 
you know, you know, we're doing this, nobody understands. And we don't really know what creative is during that time. What we do, the coolest thing is try to copy what we like. Mm. So the first time mainly is like copy, more like UK rock, that kind of stuff. But yeah, from that we start to understand the uh, different instrument, different sound from the instrument. Then start to have the idea what is how sh- how to shape a sound different part to make it become to a proper sound. So I think that period of time really helped me to gain understand or really know the very basic of uh, how to make a song. And even now, I really appreciate that moment to, to give me the knowledge about uh, how to listen and to understand the, you know, how to play with the different instruments or musicians, even on the stage where the, where the instrument should be. And uh, when you're making music, you try to place the pan the, the sound the where where the where the instruments should be uh, when you're hearing them. So I think so that was like that was like your music school. I think totally, totally. Yeah, you, yeah. You had the the music school of the streets. <laughs> For sure. What and Josh? What about what about you? How what was your uh, your introduction to to music? Uh, I grew up seeing my dad play guitar. And when you're like five years old, it's just all you want to do is everything that your dad did. So I kind of started there, moved into piano. I was classically trained for seven or eight years. And I was always terrible at reading the music. I could just, for some reason, I could never quite get a grip on how to perform well while playing the music, but I could hear it once and play it back. So I got in this modality where I would ask my teacher to play it for me and then I would do it. So she stopped doing that because she thought I was cheating. Um, (laughs) As that was the case, uh, classical was not a good fit. I ended up in jazz. I did jazz in high school, and then I did marching band. And (laughs) then I went to USC for music business um, because I didn't know that you could do, you could make music for a living. But I went there to study music business because I was like, okay, I love music. I can at least be around it my whole life, be around these crazy unicorns that actually make music for a living. And so kind of out of that, I worked in the business for a little bit and I was moonlighting, making music for The Bachelor and a bunch of like reality TV. And uh, that led me to assist uh, Toby Gad, who's a phenomenal Grammy winning record producer. I found him on Craigslist. It was crazy. And how is, um, and so for most of you, there was always when you you, you were kind of born with it, like with something in you that was musical. And I think Cha Cha would be interesting now that you're making documentaries, do you think that the growing up on, on, on making film, growing up on those Bollywood films and having that music within the film and the dancing and all the, the theatre that is that Bollywood, do you think that that has influenced your performance as you've, as you've kind of progressed? I have to have the comments with the local minority music and the, and the form, the how, way how they perform music. You know, it was the very passionate dancing with the voice, it was how natural they get involved with singing and dancing, and uh, how how deep in, uh, how deeply the music involved with their daily life. I just, I just find this very interesting. Uh, made me start to think like I'm in the middle of the high mountains in a small village. Somehow to see something outside of the world, you feel connected with. Uh, even some of the melodies are somehow uh, similar. Uh, not all, but some of the melody make you say, oh, the, I've heard maybe the grandmas or friends will sing that similar thing. So I start to, I don't know, I, I feel music is something magic. Uh, to be a certain language that maybe you will be able to communicate with uh, people from different places. So I think because of that makes me uh, more interested and want to go over the mountain to see what the other side of the mountain is like, what the other side of the, where I'm living is like. So I think that's also very uh, big, uh, how do you say, 
a push for me. I may be curious. No, yeah, yeah, so the so the music, and we were kind of talking about this a little bit um, before we um, got on here, but the, the music injected a little bit of a explorer um, into you. So you know, I, mean, I, I would love to get a little bit more perspective of when you say a small village and stuff like that. Like, what are, where are we talking, and wh and what are we what are we talking? Because the progress from from that to, to where you are now is, is fascinating. I'm from southwest part of China, which you know, if you have a, a map shape in your head about China, it's a, a minority area. It's with Yunnan, with Sichuan, with Hunan. Then uh, where I come from is Guizhou, it's uh, pretty high. Then close over, we also close to uh, Tibet, uh, with that kind of higher area. I born and grow up there, so I I really feel um I belong to there. I my roots is there, but I can feel the the somehow the mixed culture inside of my gene, you know. So I can I I can have some understanding that the different cultures mix in there. Yeah, you can you can feel you can feel the roots of of your upbringing and then the roots of of your music as well. The, this is um. You know, a lot of the people who are watching this will be from different parts of, of Asia. Um, maybe I'll go up to Josh first and just kind of ask you the, your, your interest in really exploring the Asian markets and really, and really tapping into those and, and, and going, to, going deep. You know, for, for a, a lot of us, well, just a lot of us, Westerners and stuff like that, we might just concentrate on the US or, you, or the UK or maybe Australia. Going into those Asian markets is a, is a lot more difficult and, and, it, and, it, and especially if you don't know the language, it can be hard as well. But you've done very well in kind of tapping into those markets. What was your think, thought process behind it and how did you do it? Well, I wish, once again, I wish I could say it was more calculated in a sense. It sort of was just go where the love is and you know I've made music for a lot of different artists and I sort of found out as I started to collaborate with artists in the general Asian territories like doing some k-pop stuff and starting to do c-pop stuff um, the listener there is very sophisticated and they can like the, the audience there the demographic there likes a lot of musicality and a lot of changes and there's a lot of finesse that goes into music that succeeds there and I love that because the the devil of my creativity is that I like things to be extremely complicated. <laughs> and sometimes that doesn't go over as well with say a US market that wants things to be very simple and linear and without much kind of change or derivation. And the Asian markets are just so colorful and explorative and expansive. And it's, it's more about the goodness of the song than about necessarily the name or the brand or the sticker associated with the song, you know? And where was it, what was the first territory that you really tried to to look at? Oh, there's two parts to this question. What was the first market you tried to 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 kind of crack into? And again, going back to what you were saying about how did you get introduced to the creators of the of C-pop and K-pop? Yeah, so I think I was doing K-pop first, and that just came through. I had a publisher out here in LA, um, and they would kind of send some of the songs that I was writing around to various artists, and one of those songs made its way to uh, this amazing company called SM in South Korea. And they liked the song, they put it with an artist and that began this collaborative relationship where I got to send the music, they asked me what they were looking for and we kind of built from there. But it all started, the song opened the door and then it was up to us to kind of maintain the relationship and grow the content we were working on. And pretty much the exact same process for, for China as well. Fascinating, yeah, right. Um, and NX, I'm just going to do with NX now. That's how I told you I'd shorten it after a while. Um, what about what for, what about for you for growing up in the US and then tackling the Asian markets as well? What was your feeling behind like the, the music side, the creative side, and the and the heritage side as, as well? 
I, um, I'm still kind of figuring out my place within the Asian markets and was really excited to this year finally go on tour in some of those areas. I was going to be supporting Lauv. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, that is not happening anymore. So that was really kind of my first um, foray into eventually being able to just perform live in front of a lot of these places. And I was going to go to Beijing and Shanghai. I was very excited. Uh, but I think for me, it's been interesting, definitely trying to figure out, you know, okay, how do I tell my story as a mixed race Asian American artist, specifically being Chinese and like, what's my relationship to my audience and how can I express my story growing up Asian American um, in the U.S. and California, but then also connect with my listeners that are in China or in other areas of Asia, too. So I think I'm still trying to figure it out, but for me, it's just been really, I guess, really lovely to just have these opportunities to be on a panel like this. I have a lot of, like, Asian community members in my area, and I'm very connected to my Chinese side of my family, but I don't get to have that same connection with my culture overseas in a lot of ways that I think I wish I did growing up, and so I guess I look at my opportunities with music now as this sort of second chance to connect myself to where my culture comes from. Um, so that's just, I think that's my most exciting part of being in the position I am now. Yeah. Right. Um, so creativity wise, before Kobe Kobe came into play, um, we were all very active and doing shows and, and creating in a, in a certain way and probably with a certain mindset. Um, I, I would like to explore the, uh, the, the changes of, of the before and, and after in a way, like what, what, and I'll start with you if that's okay, Josh, what were, what was your thought pattern and what was your, what was your trajectory or what were you looking at doing and what were some of the techniques and some of the things you were doing for? And what are some of the things that you've really just had to change in in these times that have maybe will change the way you do things forever? Yeah, I mean, I'll say I was traveling a lot and going to a lot of studios and meeting with artists in different countries. And there's something that I love about going to a country and spending time there before you make music, because you really get a chance to eat the food, walk the streets, you know, have a beer in a local bar, and you just feel like you can immerse in the culture. And that's something, that was one of my favorite things about, you know, making music with artists in all these different territories. So that's been a huge transition, uh, which is not permanent. <laughs> um, but something that I've loved about the COVID transition is before this, there was, at least from my perspective, a bit of a closed-minded approach to songwriting sessions collaboratively, where you would expect to write with someone when they were in town. And when they weren't in town, you didn't work together because it just was weird and people didn't know how to do it and nobody wanted to climb that mountain of technical difficulties and zooms and cameras not working and sending voice notes back and forth whatever people didn't want to do it and so your collaborator range is really limited and what i like now with this new covid creative development is i can wake up you know at 7 a.m one day and work with my favorite producer duo in italy or i can stay up until 1 a.m. and work with an amazing producer in Japan or in China. And there's, there's all this, these collaborations where we wouldn't think to do them or people wouldn't necessarily want to learn how to do them from technological standpoints. And we've all been kind of forced into that growth together. So I really like that this COVID era is taking creativity and making it so global, you know? Um, are you finding the, the, the same thing, um, Chacha? Are you doing any collaboration? Do you, is this like a, is the new um, is the, are you doing more more songwriting collaborations through Zoom than, than you were or or anything like that? I mean, like I do a lot of collaboration anyway with uh, friends from different places. We use doing email or something, you know. So even the time is like now with the coronavirus and every lockdown, but. It, it didn't really stop uh, the way how we collaborate music. I'm not, I'm not really like the very face to like this kind of screen. I'm always scared of the screen. So I try to not involve if I can. <laughs> so, <laughs> so talking behind the email and, uh, and the track files is okay. I feel more comfortable. And uh, actually I find it's, interesting i've been actually thinking about that um 
because we're, we've been all locked down. Uh, everybody was saying like, oh, we have plenty of time that we can make a lot of music and, you know, and, you know, you, you don't have anything else to do. But actually, it's weird for me. Like, uh, it's been uh, all, more than half a year for how the things have been moved in China. Yeah. And I probably only made a couple of songs, a couple of new songs. Then is that and all, all the couple of songs and mainly for a few songs, but mainly for some uh, projects. So for myself, own creation, I I didn't even do it one. I've been thinking about this why because I think it's a it's a quiet time, but it's also with a how to say tremendous information involved in this quiet time mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. it's every day you know so long that every day we face into a crazy up down information crazy news from all the world from friends from another country you know it's uh it, it's it's mad for me too much and I feel like my head have no time and my heart have no time to digest all that. And then I need a bit of time to really get an understand what it is exactly going on in this world and how it affects everybody's normal uh, life. Mm. So I don't know. I, I haven't even watched the one movie i think the most time make me feel comfortable just uh, read a book and go running uh in the nature area to make me to feel uh to how do you save a little bit of space for 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 my own so you have been doing you're doing the belt you're doing those balcony sessions weren't you is that uh, is that that's a recent yeah. more recent thing right yeah i think uh, this is the project uh, the original project was the, the idea was go do street life is uh, because I I was forced the, the first three months I forced lockdown in my hometown with my family that was a wonderful but uh, in, I looked at my city is uh, I never see in my lifetime any town in China so I was doing running around the city then. I telling myself saying like, look, this kind of view probably will never ever happen again. The city is empty because of the worldwide crazy virus disaster. And I somehow I want to record this. Somehow I want to film this and link with my music. Of course, I hope it's not gonna happen again though, but yeah. this is a very rare. And in the beginning part is that we don't know how hard it will go. Uh, how crazy it will be, but look at the world now is pretty crazy. So, but even if even if you're not like physically creating anything, you're going for these runs, you're doing it like that's part of your that that could lead to a lot of creativity. You're observing, and observation is yeah, is I've, is often important when it comes to to writing, and especially if you're a lyricist and trying to get lyrics. Yeah, I I think talk about creativity, I. I don't think creativity is at the moment you sit in front of the desk and working with your instrument and the software. I think that the creativity is come from your daily life and the thoughts about what's happening and going on and the connection between you and the world. What about you? How have you found the creative process, like um, I, I, the momentum that was happening before COVID and then having to kind of change, potentially change your, your thinking patterns around creativity. Yeah, really similar to Cha Cha. I think it's just been really hard for me to find the mental capacity to start something when so much is happening in the world. And we haven't even been in it as nearly as long as China has been dealing with coronavirus. And like every single day, there's just something new that pops up. And so finding the space for yourself to kind of feel like you have the 
energy to make something is really hard. And it's definitely very different too now where I don't get to work with people on a day-to-day basis. And that's one of my favorite things that I got to do before all of this happened was just going to somebody's studio, sitting down, talking about life and making something together. And you can do that through things like Zoom or texting or emailing or whatever it may be, but it's just never going to be the same as the experience of sitting with them in person and just riffing off of one another. And so that's the thing that I miss the most. And it's been really hard to kind of sit in my home and, you know, be here and just think, oh man, this would be so much better if there was somebody else here. And I'm just sitting there by myself thinking, are my ideas good enough? Like, am I going to be able to make something at the end of the day? And it's been really difficult. Like any creative is probably having such a hard time right now because one of the most important things we can do is just flex the muscle of trying to use our brains to make something. But when the world is throwing so much hard stuff at you, it's really hard to like feel like you can do that on a consistent basis. So for me, I guess I'm I'm doing my best, but I also know that it'll come with time where it feels like it's easier to do all the sorts of things that I love to do because right now we're just trying to navigate the new normal. And so I have to just be patient with myself and not beat my brain up for the fact that it's really hard to make a new song every now and then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought we were talking about the process during COVID, not so much the creative experience. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to pretend that this hasn't been difficult <laughs> for me. Like, oh, everything's fine. I'm just over here making tons. Of- no, it's been, it's been very tough to be creative. I found, especially with lyrics. Mm-hmm. And I've done a lot of kind of deep diving where it's like, okay, I can produce. I can come up with melodies all day. But when it gets down to doing lyrics, it's really tough right now. Mm-hmm. And I've been trying to distill why that is. And I think the first problem is that we write about life mm-hmm. and we're not really living in the sense that we used to, where it's like, okay, if I asked you to write a song about going out to a bar six months ago, you'd do that. No problem. But now you have to sit and think like, Oh, what was that like going <laughs> to a bar? I don't, I don't, it's like a foggy distant memory, you know? So I feel like in that sense, it's hard because you don't have much to draw from aside like old memories that you kind of don't want to revisit because they're sort of a bummer when you compare them to where the world is. And somebody also told me that creativity is like the highest state of evolutionary comfort Mm. Um, in the sense that like, imagine if you were a caveman, you're not going to be drawing art on the side of your cave if there's like a saber tooth tiger out to kill you. (laughs) so for for that reason your brain will only allow you to be creative when it is sure you are perfectly safe completely Mm -hmm. safe and right now nothing feels safe and if you start to feel safe there will be a news article or an instagram post or a tweet that will make sure that you don't feel safe anymore and i think being in that state of always feeling threatened evolutionarily it's very hard to create because the pressure and the stress of that threat is just so overwhelming. That's a great point. I had not thought about it that way. <laughs> yeah. Been doing a lot of really? research trying to figure it out. I'm like, what's wrong with me? I need to <laughs> rationalize. Everything's so crazy right now. I need something to just tell you, you're not crazy. This is 100%. exactly why it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And you know, it's funny too. I've talked to so many creatives about this problem. And every time I talk to somebody, it's like this guilty confession. Mm-hmm. like people are like you know what if I'm being honest it's been really hard for me to create as if it's like something's wrong with them and I've had this conversation with a dozen people now and everyone is telling the same story and I'm like guys we need to be honest about this publicly I think because we're all sitting in our bubble thinking hating ourselves thinking oh goodness I haven't written 12 songs this week what's wrong with me mm-hmm. but we're all in the same experience you know you know in terms of preparation for uh, for things to come, what are some of the things that you are that you're wanting to? I mean, Chacha, you played a live gig the other day. How did it, how did it feel to be able to like in in preparation for us all to be able to get out again and experience the the visceral feeling of a live show or or a live recording session? How did it how did it feel to be able to get back out and um, and play live again? I, I loved it, and you know, also doing. Um I, I had uh, two shows so far, uh, one in May and one in uh, June. Uh, it goes uh, with a live streaming show. But the second show starts to, uh, because in June, you start to can uh, apply the show that sell tickets. So we ha- I did the show with another band, so we have uh, 200, more than 200 people come to the show because uh, they uh, they have to cool the uh, control 
only can come a certain amount of people, like uh, 30% to capacity of the space. So we have 200 people there, which is uh, amazing. You Then I actually perform with a brand new set, with the new setup then. So it's the whole feeling is a new, new feeling. New feeling, which as an artist is exciting to have a new feeling. We talk about music. We're thinking the musical way. Everything is thinking somehow trigger in your mind how to make a song or make a track. But because of this period of time, we still talk a lot of things not about music. We're thinking things. I, I do feel this period of time make me to look up to the world than not thinking things with the musical logic. I think uh, that's very new angle. So what about the, you guys? The, what, do you think the, this might be a controversial question these days, do you think the live streaming performance is going to hold out? And how are you feeling about, as creators and as musicians, how are you feeling about doing the, the live streaming gigs? Um, I actually really enjoy it for a lot of the majority that I do it. And I live stream a lot. I live stream like three times a week for hours, uh, like just to talk with my audience. Even if I'm not even singing, I just chat with them and we catch up about life because I think the most important thing you could have right now is a friend. And so if I can just be a person that these individuals who listen to my music can interact with and escape their life a little bit right now, that's really important to me and my relationship that I hold with the people. That, well, hey, um, what, platform, what platform are you using? I use Twitch. Yeah. For the most Twitch, part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I have done a handful of like live streaming festivals where I sit there and I sing a few songs for people and I, you know, it's pretty incredible just to see how many people are willing to take time out of their day to tune into a lineup of artists that are singing a few songs in their home studios. And I think that it's it's kind of brought the artists and the audience together closer in a bit, even though we find ourselves really far apart in this moment in time. You're getting to be brought into people's home spaces where they create music and where they live and, and um, just make anything that you feel an emotional connection to and you get to see their spaces and see them as humans and not somebody who's up on a stage with a huge live performance that they're like produced out to some crazy level with, I don't know, I want to say like, <laughs> like confetti and huge light shows and everything like that. So I think that it's definitely going to hold throughout the period of our lives past COVID-19. I think that there's going to be a market for people to, to hold these things in other spaces. So that way individuals are going to crave it, I think, to a certain extent, even though live shows are something that we all really miss right now. And I really miss performing in them. Um, I think individuals are going to also really just wish that there would be more live streams where they can see their favorite artists because not everybody can go to a city near them that has a, a person coming to visit and play live, but most people can tune into a Twitch stream where they can see their person just singing a song with an acoustic guitar. So I don't know. I think that there's definitely the space for it and it'll probably be something that exists beyond this point, uh, but I really miss playing live. I'm not going to lie to you. I really miss it. <laughs> Because it is, it is, it is hard. It's definitely, if you're using Twitch as a platform, it's definitely harder to make money from yes. that. Mm -hmm. And is, and uh, is that going to change the psychology of the audience of when they come and see mm. you play live? And is there the, the possibility of everybody feels like they've been in your lounge room and that they really, really know you because you've had spent so many hours together. That familiarity takes away. It used to be really, there was an enjoyment of being, the distance. Mm. So is there any fears that of the change in dynamic of the, of the audience because, because of that potentially, and also the fear of not being able to monetize in the same yeah. way? Mm -hmm. Twitch is definitely a lot harder and a lot of live streaming platforms are a lot harder to monetize. I, I thankfully, I feel very fortunate to be in a position where I don't need to monetize it very heavily. And I do a lot of focus around charity work with what sort of money I do make on a platform like Twitch. And, um, but I think in kind of my space of artists where I'm a younger artist who's really kind of venturing into the music industry for the first time, there's a lot of other individuals that I think have garnered the same sort of relationship from the very beginning with their audience where it feels very close. And I completely credit that sort of closeness that I foster to a lot of my 
ability and success that I've found with being a musician because I think that relationship and the interactions I had where I was, you know, the girl sitting in her bedroom live streaming with my audience every Saturday night, find my voice and my musician work and, and everything like that. But I don't know. I think it's definitely different person to person and artist to artist. For me, I feel lucky that the live streaming format works really well with where I started and it's not too different from um, what I had to do a year ago and what we find ourselves in with COVID-19 quarantine right now. So yeah, I think it's just different person to person. And what about you, Josh? How do you feel about the uh, about playing live again and the psychology is a, around that as a, both an artist and uh, from an audience perspective? I mean, I I love live performances, and I wish that I could say that I was as good at uh, live streaming as MXM Tune clearly is. She's like a master. After we're done with the Zoom, you got to give me some lessons. I feel like every time, every time I do a live stream on Instagram or something, I'm like, I can't believe people want to watch me do this. Like, and then I'm trying to read the comments. I'm like leaning into the phone while I'm seeing. I just feel like it's there's this awkward kind of experience for me personally where I feel like I'm trying to pay attention to a lot of different things at once, and that split in focus is very perceptible. And at the same time, I think on the audience side, I've noticed when I have done a couple live streams that my audiences, like the people who I kind of hang out with on these, their focus is also split. And that's cool in a way because I get to be like live, the live pianist in their living room while they're working or something like that. And that's a cool experience to like be the Nordstrom's guy, but in somebody's living room. That's like <laughs> Discussion that I can, could just keep on talking and asking you, you questions, but um, we do need to wrap it up. But before we do, is there any, um, well, a couple of things. Is there anything that you've been thinking of and that you, before this that you wanted to kind of tell to the people who may or may not be listening to us and reading as we read the comments when they come up? <laughs> Josh, any, any uh, parting words and, and plug anything that you may have, uh, may, may be able to plug right now? Um, I mean, I'll say, I guess, I, I'm assuming that there's going to be a lot of kind of fellow creatives and musicians and people we're getting to spend time with on this panel. And um, I guess my overarching comment that I would leave with is, I think that I suck and I have imposter syndrome. And I think most great creatives, every great creative that I have studied, you know, everyone from like the Da Vinci's and, and all those guys, these, they all suffer from this idea that whatever they've done isn't as good as what they want it to be. Mm. And I hate that feeling and I'm slowly learning to love it because that means that you always want to get better. Mm. Um, and even when I'm collaborating with people, sometimes I'll say dare to suck, which is like my mantra to myself to remind myself that part of being creative is making mistakes and is going out on a limb and is doing something stupid and taking a risk and I think right now that's harder than ever with Zoom and with remote sessions and with, God forbid, sitting alone, creating. Um, it's so easy to do what's safe and it's so easy to do what you know will work and is within the box. But I don't think that's what makes this job the best job in the world. I think it's taking those risks, falling nine times and sticking to one landing and it's all worth it. So. Yeah, that's what I'd say. <laughs> Great. Anything to plug? Uh, well, I'm such a bad plugger. <laughs> I've got a, a song, I guess by the time this airs, um, it will have come out. Uh, it's called Worth Missing. It comes out on July 3rd, and it has a music video that we shot in Tokyo, kind of gorilla style. It was awesome. I almost fell off of a roof. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. So check that out. <laughs> Great. And find you on all your uh, social media. Uh, Cha Cha, any closing, any closing words, anything to plug? Promotion is a very difficult for musicians, especially independent musicians. So in the end part, if you're interested in the topic, follow us and listen to our music, share to your friends, and uh, yeah, that that's the that's the ending part for me. <laughs> Um, Tune D, I, M extension. <laughs> I have so many new nicknames it's from this. <laughs> yeah. um, I would say to any creative who's watching this, just be patient with yourself. Sometimes being creative is one of the hardest things you can do. And um, 
it can't be forced. So just allow it to come to you. Uh, sometimes it'll be really, it'll take a while, but patience is one of the most important things you can ever have as an individual, whether or not you're an artist. And so uh, just give yourself the time, give yourself the time and the space. As for things that I have to plug, I don't really know, but you can follow me on social media. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hang out on Twitch. Yes. Sometime <laughs> soon. Yeah, send lots of hearts all their way. Uh, so thank you to the uh, International Independent Music Season for um, bringing us together in our four squares here. Um, uh, I hope you guys stay safe. I hope everybody stays safe. I hope you uh, stay creative or get creative. And at the end of all this, whenever that may be, um, I'll, we'll see each other at a market stall somewhere in uh, a suburb of China at 4 a.m. eating some fantastic food. You're stopping, okay. yeah. Yeah, he's hoping. Um, thanks, guys. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Well. 大家好,我是国乐行者方景中,我是2020上海国际独立音乐节的推荐官。I'm a Chang Hongyue, I'm 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 a Chang
我是朱静熙，我是二零二零上海国际独立音乐季推荐官。我是辛巴，我是二零二零年上海国际独立音乐季的推荐官。我是国乐行者方锦荣，我是二零二零上海国际独立音乐季的推荐官。我是包颂平，金西木兰，马子木，黑坤，周瑜，威尔利纳邦内，巴麦克塞姆丘，劳德斯，鲁克考雷巴，考德莱恩，布莱斯伯纳斯，我来自中国香港，新加坡，湖南，爱尔兰，意大利，加拿大 ，U.S. Denmark。Steve Rocks, E R L, Faith Kivol, Bowman Di Zhu, Wei Guo Gong. Listen to the world's music. Shanghai International Independent Music Season. 欢迎与我一起支持独立音乐。我在上海国际独立音乐季。我在上海国际独立音乐季。上海国际独立音乐季。我在上海国际独立音乐季。上海国际独立音乐季。我在上海国际独立音乐季。欢迎与我一起来支持独立音乐，支持原创音乐，尊重独立音乐。从我做起，保护音乐版权。我们将在这里看见全球独立音乐行业新观点，看见当下全球新锐的独立音乐人。欢迎大家与我一起推动独立音乐的发展壮大，看见独立音乐的更多可能。